And one time we were way back in there someplace. We were sitting on the edge of a, a ridge and uh, looking into a drainage. And uh, he said, let me show you how this thing works, you know. And he blew on that thing and nothing happened. And uh, I said, well, let me try mine. And uh, <laughs> I, I blew mine. And I distinctly remember this. There was a bull across the, on the other side of the rim, and you know, down through the basin up on the other side, directly across from us, probably, I don't know, three quarters of a mile away, went absolutely ballistic. And it would run up the ridge and bugle, and it would run down the ridge and bugle. And uh, it was amazing. And uh, that night, that bull came right into camp and bugled. And he was convinced that maybe it did work. <laughs> <laughs> These are stories of outdoor adventure and expert advice from folks with calloused hands. I'm James Nash, and this is the Six Ranch Podcast. The Six Ranch Podcast is brought to you by Sig Sauer. Sig is a leading provider and manufacturer of firearms, electro optics, ammunition, air guns, and suppressors. For over 250 years, Sig Sauer Inc. has evolved and thrived by blending American ingenuity, German engineering, and Swiss precision. Today, Sig Sauer is synonymous with industry leading quality and innovation which has made it the brand of choice amongst the U.S. military, the global defense community, law enforcement, competitive shooters, hunters, and responsible citizens. Sig Sauer is also a premier provider of elite firearms instruction and tactical training at the Sig Sauer Academy located in New Hampshire. For more information about Sig Sauer and its complete line of products, visit SigSauer.com. So you wanted to hear about my uh, cougar story? Yeah. Well, um, it was it was in one of my favorite places. My dad and I and my grandfather and I have uh, been going to that place since I can remember. And it's uh, very hard to get to. Uh, the trail's gone now, though uh, it's pretty... It's pretty gnarly uh, spot. Um, so I was, I was kind of late in the evening uh, looking into this basin, and I heard a bunch of elk bugling down there. And uh, I knew I couldn't get down in there before dark. I didn't want to run them off. So the next day I showed up about two hours sooner and started to go down in there thinking uh, I might be hearing some bugling. And I didn't hear anything. It was quiet and that was puzzling to me and I started walking further on down in there than I cared to without hearing anything didn't want to blow them out and uh, I saw something in the grass and it looked like a cat's ears I thought now it's got to be a bobcat and so I was carrying at the time a rubber blunt so I put a blunt on and I started walking towards it real carefully and all of a sudden uh, I realized it was it was <laughs> you're just gonna blunt a bobcat for the fun of it yeah I wanted to see how high it jumped <laughs> and so uh, I, I realized that the thing was actually advancing towards me and he came to the edge of the taller grass and it was a cougar and it was on its belly and it started making some pretty uh, eerie noises, kind of like a couple of alley cats, a couple of house cats in, uh, you know, flirting season or whatever. I, it, uh, it unnerved me. I, I switched uh, my blunt out real quick, got a broadhead on there. I didn't want to shoot it. And so I just started walking backwards. I knew you didn't want to turn your back on something like that. And, you know, we... We walked backwards for quite a while. It was following. It was, it was following me right along, and in in a aggressive posture. And I came to a spot, and it's getting a little evening 
by now, a little darkish. I came to a spot in the trail that was a little bit rugged, and I had to turn around. There was a bunch of rocks and snag or something there. So I thought I better just hold it, hold my position. That dang thing just kept coming, and it uh, it stopped, and uh, it was tense. It started uh, shifting its weight from foot to foot, and its tail was whipping, and the end of it was recoiling and, and twisting, and I thought, you know, I feel like a robin in the yard, and the house cat's about to jump on it, you know, and I thought, if I don't shoot now on a, on a still shot, I don't think I could hit it when it's coming at me, and I wasn't sure, but what, this thing wasn't going to start, you know, attacking me right now, so I drew back and torched one off, and it hit it just right, right in the wishbone, and uh, the thing just leapt in the air, and did about three cartwheels and was screaming and tore off down through the brush and I could hear it rattling on poles in this thicket and I I thought I better just get the hell out of here. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to go down there and see how good a shot I made. I didn't want any part of that. So I went home with the hair standing on the back of my neck and got to camp and told my hunting buddy uh, that I don't know if I did the right thing, but I, I put an arrow in a cougar. And uh, we should go and look for it in the morning and see what, what the deal was. So come morning, we went down there, and the blood trail was about six inches wide, and it went straight to the nearest cliff, which was about 200 yards away. And we peered over that, and right at the bottom, straight down, there was a cougar laying there. And so uh, we went down to the bottom there and uh, looked. And uh, the thing from the arrow entry point clear to its uh, ass was bloody, you know, except for two spots, the teats. Mm. They were cleaned off. And so we started looking around like, okay, there's kittens here somewhere probably. But at that time, since they had... Uh, prevented hound hunting, you know, there was really no way to control the population, and the thought of maybe getting two more was just a bonus, I thought, so we just walked away and figured that was maybe a threefer. Yeah. That was that one. Yeah. That's, uh, you are shooting a longbow or a recurve at the time? At that time, I was shooting a um, compound. A compound. Yeah. Yeah, that was about the time I I switched. So about what year was that? It was 1997. Okay. Yeah, I, I took a, uh, a trip with that thing, I think maybe the next year, into a, a two, it was a two-day pack to get to the, the spot, to the camp. And with I remember, mules? Yeah. And uh, so I got into camp and uh, got my bow out. And uh, it's a pain in the ass with a, a compound because you got to take it in there in one piece, and it's it's always in the way and in harm's way too. And pulled it out and uh, set up a little target and uh, pulled back. And when I let go, the swedged end off the cable blew off. And the only place that I knew to fix it, it was a it was a Martin, it was in Athena. <laughs> so I went to Athena. And so, like, two-thirds of my hunting trip was blown. I never uh, used that again after yeah. that. Yeah. Fortunately, they've gotten a lot better. But, like, that backcountry hunt that we went on a couple of years ago, you know, going in, into camp there, you know, we'd been riding in the dark for a few hours, and um, me, and the, me and the pony took a little tumble, and the pony <laughs> went over the top of me, and I had my bow over my back, and... Um, there's not a good way to pack a compound on a horse. And fortunately, my, my bow was all right, and my, my binos protected that my chest from getting a saddle horn punched through it. I couldn't bugle right for a couple of days. <laughs> but uh, no, I, I think that for a, for a sure enough backcountry hunt, having a, 
a takedown recurve that you know you can pull both limbs off of roll it up with all your arrows and have everything protected and in, inside of a pack somewhere that's a good solution it sure is i've yeah. many a time uh pulled into a meadow and heard you know a big bull on the edge of the other side of the meadow and dumped a pack and put that thing together and went for a little hunt but it's a uh, it's nerve-wracking trying to get everything just right string that bow and Keep the horses quiet. <laughs> That's pretty exciting. I want to go back to that incident where you got you and the pony rolled. Uh huh. You left out the most noteworthy thing. Your foot was stuck in the stirrup. Yeah. And the horse was pulling against it. And uh, I said, You need some help? And you went, Yes. <laughs> and I thought, Well, that's a, that's an interesting way to say get the hell over here I, and I uh, I responded quickly got that uh, horse by the halter just yeah. in time yeah and you got my foot out of the stirrup because I was riding in my hunting boots like an idiot <sighs> and and honestly I've been good about only wearing cowboy boots on a horse my whole life and never wearing lace up boots on a horse mm -hmm. and you know that was beat into me as a kid mm -hmm. you don't do it yeah and for folks who don't know, the reason you don't is because the bottom of a cowboy boot is slick and then it's got a gap and then a heel and that keeps your foot from sliding all the way through the stirrup. But if for some reason you do get your foot all the way through the stirrup and you're off the horse, if that horse takes off, then your boot can come off. Mm -hmm. But if you're laced up, you're probably just along for the ride. What people have told me you're supposed to do if you are hung up and, and a horse takes off is you're supposed to roll underneath the horse and let him step on you to pull you out of the of the stirrup or, or break the stirrup. Or, you know, you do whatever you got to do. In that case, we were on the edge of, you know, a, a terrifically big and steep canyon and had that horse not been good and steady and had gotten scared and took off, it could have been a real disaster. Yeah, you wouldn't have probably made it. There's so many rocks and things to get your head whacked on, you yeah. know, and a horse running. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. I always just just hook my big toe on yeah. on the uh, stirrup and I check it constantly. I always look always look down there. Okay, I'm safe. I can pop off of this thing real quick. When I was guiding back here in the in the caps, you know, we had these crappy dude horses and you know these these horses that just shouldn't have been on a trail, but you know they're they're cheap horses, and that's what you needed for that type of a guide outfit. And I would kick off my bottom stirrup all the time um, when we we're in really steep stuff or really shaly stuff, so that if that horse did start to go, you know my bottom side was all already free, and I could bail off on the top side of the trail and hopefully let the horse go. But I had this uh, this appy Arab cross named biscuit i think it was a rotten horse and it would not pay attention and when you'd get to a switchback it would just keep walking and you know the trail switches back because it can no longer go forward <laughs> most of the time and uh gosh i can't i can't tell you how many times i had to bail off that horse and it'd roll down the hill three or four times and i think all right this is it this is the time that it's just gonna break every leg and and be done but it scramble back up somehow all wide-eyed and pay attention for another half mile or so and then do it again it's nerve-wracking yeah you add that to uh other scenarios that have nothing to do with a sleepy horse like uh a mule right that uh, reacts to some loud scratching of of shoes on a rock ledge happened to me one time in a terrible spot and the the pack horse had to jump up about a i don't know 30 inch like ledge right in the middle of the trail i mean you couldn't go up the trail without doing that and uh you know sparks and you know metal on on the rock startled the mule and so just as the horse was in its most vulnerable position you know uh, out of balance the mule jerked back and it dropped that horse back in the trail with 
these big rocks on both sides of it. And it was held in there with the pack boxes and like kind of spring loaded down into the trail. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was, uh, I don't know, probably a minute and a half before I got to it. And uh, it was wheezing already. Like it wasn't going to be long that this, this horse could, could live in this situation. So I, I think I cut the cinch. And oh, really? I, yeah. And I grabbed its halter and uh, kind of went back over the top of it and pulled as hard as I could, and it wriggled a little bit, and it got loose, and it just started head over heels, just cartwheel down, and it came, it, it came to a rest at the base of a tree. It hit the tree about two feet off the ground and fell down at the base of the tree, and its legs were both hanging out on, on both sides of the tree over like about a 50 foot drop off and the thing was trying to scooch around it had no idea it was sitting on the edge of a cliff <laughs> and it was trying to scooch around to get on one of his two feet whichever one he could get and uh holy smoke was that ever a, a tense moment we tied we tied its head i think and uh and pulled uh me and my buddy for all we were worth, and it finally kind of rolled over and got away from the tree and whew, saved it. But yeah. that was tense. Have you ever um, had a horse die or had to kill a horse in the mm. back country? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I had a unfortunate experience with my dad. It was a, it was a real long day. We'd, we'd gone in to uh, take an elk camp out, and I was probably 10 years old, and it was... Uh, extremely cold and we went up this steep switchback trail and the mule went on the lower side of a tree out of the trail and the pack horse went around the right way and they got all twisted up around that tree and horse went down and my dad got the cinch off somehow and it either broke its halter or uh, lead rope and it did that it end over end down the hill and it really picked up speed and it, it hit the a pine tree with with like six inch limbs that are all pointing back up the hill and it knocked about half a dozen of those big limbs off mm -hmm. and uh it had head injuries we uh decided to take a different route and we distributed his pack on the other horses and we just let him uh, walk behind and he kept up with us for a while it was, as I remember, probably about three in the morning and uh, we came to this little grade and we were like two miles from the end of the trail and uh, it stopped and I was in the back and dad said, uh, come on, whack him, you know, and he was he was being pulled by the horse in front. We tied him up after a while. We, we realized he was going to get out, you know, be able to come out and I was whacking on him for all his worth and dad was pulling on him and he just went down on his knees and rolled off the trail and yeah that was his last breath and uh, so yeah i had had that experience and then up in uh frank church a uh, bunch of wolves uh were hassling the horses and mm. i had two fresh two green mules that I, well they weren't green they were just new to me um i had a mule die in the past year, just old age. And my uncle gave me two mules to use on that trip. And uh, they were a bunch of quitters. They didn't want to mother up with the bell mare that I had. They just wanted to leave together. What is a bell mare? It's uh, what keeps a bunch of mules together. If you have a, a mare who is familiar with the mules or the mules are familiar with the mare, you can't hardly uh, separate them. So if you stake the mare out, then you've got the mules. And, you know, that happened. That that works 90% of the time. Because <laughs> <laughs> usually the last one you got will probably test the, the system on you. But uh, so where was, I, where was I going with this one? Uh, wolves and oh. Frank Church. Yeah, so I ha I just decided that 
I'd keep one of those two mules tied and one I'd let graze. And I'd do that, you know, twice a day before we uh, take off. And then when we get to camp next place, you know, I'd, I'd, they'd alternate. They'd get enough to eat. But this one night, um, we had we had wolves right in the trail, right right around the camp, and uh, got out there on the meadow, and uh, that mule was was dead. Hmm. Had broken its neck, is what I presume, and I would imagine that it it fought uh, against the lead rope and got its head underneath him somehow and uh, upside down. But I had tied him high and tight. That's what my dad always told me. And you're in that situation, you know, where they don't have rope to tangle in. Right. You don't want them to get a leg up uh-uh. over the top of the rope. No. And, yeah. Anyway, yeah, it happens. Yeah, it's a, it's a tough thing. What are some animals that, that when you're when you're packing, you don't want to run into on the trail? Llamas. <laughs> Llamas, they're the worst. Yeah, yeah, and the, and worse than that, it's uh, backpackers that don't understand horses. Yeah, and uh, it's happened more than once. Some backpacker sees us coming and thinks he's doing us a favor by trying to get behind the nearest tree, and so the horses normally see him, but. When you get halfway down the string, maybe one of the mules hasn't. Right. And all of a sudden, they realize they're three feet away from this thing that's got ski poles and dangling cups and bright colors and, you know, says hi or something, you know. And that can be a real blowout. Yeah. Yeah. But the absolute worst is bees. Bees. Yeah. Bees are bad, for Mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. That can cause a lot of chaos all at once. But, you know, llamas... You know, I'm. Everybody knows that I'm. I'm critical of llamas, but there's a good reason for it, and and that is that horses and mules are absolutely terrified of them. They are the way they smell, the way they look, the sounds they make. Horses and mules have a really fearful reaction to that, and a lot of these trails that we're on are five inches wide, six inches wide, and off to the side might be a thousand or 2000 feet of drop and there's no place to stop anywhere down there. Um, and if you start having these animals panic and things start breaking and they start rolling off the trail, it turns into an absolute disaster. And I honestly think that if somebody is, were to take a llama into the back country, that a horse's reaction to seeing that llama is going to be similar to if that person had instead decided to dress up in a grizzly bear suit. Mm -hmm. And I think everyone can recognize that the guy that dressed up in a grizzly bear suit is, is doing something that, you know, is, is irresponsible because we know that that's going to scare these animals and, and cause a lot of problems. But for whatever reason, people think it's okay to, to do the same thing with llamas. And I just, it, it, it's unnecessary. Like we have, we have such better options than a freaking llama to carry a little bit of weight into the back country. Like, just don't do that. I know it's trendy. I know it's trendy right now. There's people that do it. Please don't, don't be one of them. I was so paranoid about it after a couple run-ins with llamas that I went and got one. Yeah. But you know, they are such weird critters, you know, the horses never really got, all of the the tricks, you know, even the very last day, the day I went, tried to round that thing up and get it out of there, you know, I had it for a couple of years. It caused the biggest commotion yet, and it was it was bleating or bellering. I don't know what you call it, but it sounded like he was being boiled in oil mm-hmm. right there in the pasture. He laid down, and you know, me and everybody I could find had to practically carry it out of the pasture. And put it in the horse trailer. When we got it in the horse trailer, we were talking or something, and uh, it uh, it jumped out through a about a sixteen or eighteen inch space between the roof and the and the back of the trailer. Just 
cleared cleared it. I don't know how it could have possibly done it. Hmm. They're just the weirdest thing, like half half monkey, half devil, half sheep. <laughs> <laughs> the gal up here on the slope hired me to trim the Islamist feet when I was 14 or 15 years old. Well, that's easy enough money. Bring some <laughs> snips out here. <laughs> I'm going to, you know, be able to go buy myself a cheeseburger and a milkshake when I'm done. And, uh, you know, it stood there nice and steady enough. And, and I picked one of its feet up and set it back down, picked it up again. Didn't seem like that big of a deal. And then I, you know, took my first snip with my little snippers. And that thing jumped up in the air. And I I think it kicked me with all four feet at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> I don't doubt it a bit. Wadded me up into a big <laughs> dust ball, and yeah, then it turned into kind of a brawl at that point. And it came out of there with its feet trimmed, but I bet you had some scrapes on you. Oh, and and that's not like I looked like I'd just gone through a combine, <laughs> and uh, smelled like an old horse blanket or worse, but. You don't want to tell people like, well, what happened to you? It looks bad. It's like, yeah, I got got by a llama. <laughs> I'm, I'm a manly man. <laughs> I, I know you didn't want to have a podcast on llamas, but I got to tell you one more thing. This crazy llama I had, it would, it would run as fast as it could straight towards a person if they'd never seen that person before and stop right at the last minute and stick his nose right on that other person's nose and stare at him. And if he liked them, he'd turn around and walk away. If he didn't, he'd spit right in their face. That's bad behavior. That's terrible behavior. How do you change it? Uh, I mean, I would kill it. I would yeah. shoot that llama. There's I a lot would, of people yeah. that eat llama around here, and they say it's great. Really? Oh, yeah. I, uh, I've i eaten a relative to the llama in, uh, in South America when I was down there fly fishing, and it tasted like bad venison, I guess hmm. is the way I'd describe it. But people eat all kinds of stuff that they think is good. What do you look for if if you were brand new and you had to start over and you had to buy some pack mules? What do you look for in a mule? Uh, gentleness, confidence, um, like a calm eye and um, catchable. Mm-hmm. That's a big, that's, <laughs> that's a big a, plus. <laughs> because you're going to have to catch it a bunch of times. Every all, time you need it, time. you, yeah. you got to catch yeah. it. Yeah. And I, I like the ones that love to get uh, scratched, yeah. you know, like scratched between the ears or in, in the ear, in mm -hmm. the big, uh, uh, you know, it's like a big, huge leaf or whatever, you know, inside there. And uh, they love that. Yeah. And, and so... There's a couple that just come running to get itched. Yeah. And then there's a couple that you've got to really work at. You got to get them cornered just right, or you tie a horse to a post along a fence, and then you kind of work it so that they get in between that horse and and you, and they can't get around the thing. Sometimes they duck under the rope and get out. But, yeah, it's very frustrating when you got to <laughs> – a really good mule that you just can't afford not to have, but you can't catch it. It's it's a pain. How about size? I like the just the the smaller, you know. I don't know what you call them. They're they're the normal size, you know, yeah. like fourteen hands, something like that, or just a little shorter than that. Those great big long lanky ones that you got to stand on a stump to pack. They they are overrated and. Plus, they're such a handful, you know, they're just so big and heavy. And even the even the skinny-looking ones, you know, their head probably weighs 100 pounds. And if chipmunk flitters over there and it looks over to see it and you're in the way, it'd knock you for a loop, you know? Right. I, I like a, a big draft mule if it has those qualities you described earlier. You know, if you can catch them, if you can rub on them and, and they like you and they're I've, d I've been around some that are just big, gentle teddy bears, and it is tough to pack them. you got to get that load up quite a bit higher. But I've been around some that are pretty happy to carry 180 or 200 pounds, mm -hmm. um, even through, through the steep stuff. 
so they can kind of do the job of, of almost two mules. Yeah. But it is tough to get them packed. Mm -hmm. And whenever you have trouble on the trail, um, it's just that much more chance of getting hurt or them hurting another animal. You know, How much weight do you want your mules to carry? Oh, I'm comfortable with like uh, 55 pounds on each side. And then if I'm, when I have to, I put a, a light top pack on it, mm -hmm. maybe 25. Yeah. There's no sense getting them wore out or, you know, I mean, there's probably uh, a few times when I've packed more than that, but it's only out of necessity. It would prevent me from getting, the, having to go back in and taking out one more, one more load. What's your, uh, what's your first memory of elk? Hmm. Uh, with my dad and, uh, going hunting when I was too young to carry a gun. Yeah. We, my dad was a great hunter, and got into a lot of elk and, you know, we'd, we'd find them. We'd get into them. Did he bow hunt too? No, never did. So what got you into archery? Oh, um, when I was adolescent age, uh, I had a, a family of boy cousins, five boys in the family, and we all had bows and arrows, and we'd shoot them, and when uh, one or two of us got to be 12 years old and get a, to, to get a hunt license, we would all rove around in a big band Shooting arrows at stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I think I hit a deer one time, and, but it was on the second bounce. It hit a it hit a rock just right. I was shooting straight down a hill, and and I think the deer was probably seventy five yards away, and it hit the ground halfway between the deer and and me, and and it glanced off a rock, and the side of the arrow hit him flat on the back. You know, it was. Uh, I cringe to think about that. I have such such fond memories of, of that time of my life as well, but also a great deal of, like, what was I doing? Like, that was so stupid. <laughs> but, I, you know, I remember for the longest time, it's like, okay, this is my good arrow. This is the one I'm going to shoot first. Mm -hmm. And, you know, nothing matched. Broadheads were, were a mess. Um, I went hunting one time, and... And got down to, you know, my my best arrow at the time had two blades on the broadhead, but it was a three blade broadhead because one blade had gotten broken <laughs> off. And I was like, oh, I'm just gonna have to get a little closer. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's a it's a disaster. But that's really the foundation that people have to build to to grow and yeah. and to learn. So when did you first start hunting elk on your own? Oh. I'd say... About what year, I guess, is what I'm getting at. Okay. Would have been 80, 1980, 1979, something like that. Was anybody calling for elk at the time? Not really. Uh-uh. It wasn't. It wasn't a thing yet. So did you just hunt them like deer and just try to yeah. ambush them or sneak up on yeah, them? Yeah, I was always tracking of running elk. That seemed like my thing. <laughs> I'd walk into the head of a draw and I'd hear crash, crash, crash. And I'd go down there and see, you know, oh man, there looked like three or four of them. And I'd just get on the trail and, you know, I'd be doing that all day long. And I learned a lot about elk, you know. I learned they, they uh, worked a circuit, you know, and uh, if you followed them long enough, you'd be right back in the same place. You busted them out the first time. Because they're in that spot for a reason. Yeah. There's usually a lead cow that grew up there, knows every rock and stick in that basin or or that along that route. I think they naturally, from uh, evolving with predators, don't want to leave sent around day after day, you know, in the right. same spot. So they rove, and uh, when you push them, they, they just go along that route, I believe. Mm-hmm. Until you've pushed them real hard, or you know, if uh, one's wounded or something, it'll break out of that um, route. So, when do you remember calling starting to become part of it? 
Well, uh, Larry Jones came to Le Grand in uh, like 1982 or something like that, mm -hmm. <laughs> I believe. And uh, he packed an auditorium, and the the noise, the elk noise that he would make was fascinating, and and it just caught on like wildfire. Everybody got calls, and and they were they were in you know the thick of it after that. My dad had a uh, like a piece of copper tubing <clears throat> looked like a supply line for a toilet or something and uh, it had a couple twists in it it was about 18 inches long and uh, he'd carved a wooden plug in one end and uh, shaved off on an angle and cut a little hole in the top of the pipe and it it made a piccolo kind of sound but it went through like several little note changes or mm -hmm. octave changes and uh, he thought that was the cat's meow and when I blew mine, after I learned how to do it and got the calls from from the you know what Larry Jones had taught, he uh, he didn't think that sounded like an elk, you know. And one time we were way back in there someplace, we were sitting on the edge of a a ridge and uh, looking into a drainage, and uh, he said, "Let me show you how this thing works," you know. And he blew on that thing, and nothing happened. And uh, I said, well, let me try mine. And uh, <laughs> I, I blew mine. And I distinctly remember this. There was a bull across the, on the other side of the rim, and, you know, down through the basin up on the other side, directly across from us, probably, I don't know, three quarters of a mile away. Went absolutely ballistic. And it would run up the ridge and bugle, and it would run down the ridge and bugle. And uh, it was amazing. And uh, that night, that bull came right into camp and bugled, and he was convinced that maybe it did work. <laughs> <laughs> and calls have changed a lot since 1982. Oh, yeah, yeah. And you've you've kept up with it. You're still a terrific caller, and you use modern equipment now. Reluctantly. Um, I think that just a, your small radiator hose and a, and a diaphragm, call it's plenty you know that's as high tech as i go yeah have you tried one of those uh it, it look it looks like the old you know grunt tube thing um but damien pagano is, is making them with liberty game calls and they're 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 softer rubber compound they sound pretty good i might try one of those oftentimes i'll hear a hunter in the woods and i'll i'll swear it's an elk sure and uh vice versa the other way yeah. around. That's even worse. That's the worst. <laughs> That's the worst when you hear something scratchy and creaking around, and it's like, "That's that's a bad hunter." Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's happened several times. I get back to camp and say, "What were you doing up in that draw?" I wasn't there, and then it's like, "Oh god, <laughs> I was so close. I just didn't want to bother you." Oh boy. So yeah. What's the uh, what's the biggest bull you ever killed? Well, um, it's, uh, it's listed, uh, in, in the Pope and Young, uh, traditional book at 333 and a half, but it scored before deductions 347 and mm. five eighths. And, uh, the 333 and a half was, uh, second in the, in the traditional book at that time in, in like 2003. And it was one eighth of an inch smaller than a bull killed in Baker County in uh, 1946, but it only stayed in number two spot for uh, about two years, and then it got bumped to third, and then fourth, and it's probably I don't know. I quit looking. Yeah, well, there was a we kind of got into the golden age of elk here for for a while, and I feel like we're maybe past that and starting to come down the other hill, but there was sure about a decade where there was a lot of big bulls around and it was natural that some of them were going to get killed by guys with, with trad bows. Uh, yeah. Tell but, me a little bit about that hunt. Well, uh, it was a family hunt and, uh, you know, we'd been going up to this one spot 
since I was a little tiny kid. In fact, there's a picture of me in a in a little papoose on the refrigerator here that uh, shows me at two months old uh, in the same spot. Hmm. We're very close, the same spot. But anyway, it was uh, when my mom and dad were alive and my sisters and my kids and wife and we all went up that spot and dad and I were we were uh, bringing the camp in with a stock and the girls were walking and they were probably a mile behind us. And uh, when we got close to camp, I heard at least three bulls bugling and I got all excited and uh, trying to be quiet. And <clears throat> we got the camp kind of squared away and put the horses out and I could hear the women coming up the trail, you know, they were laughing and giggling and hollering and, and so I ran down there and I said, shh, shh, shh you guys, there's, there's a bunch of bugling elk up here. If you wouldn't mind toning it down a little bit, I'm going to go after them in the morning and I want them to, to stick around, you know. And they said, oh, you can stuff that up there, you know. If we come up here to have a good time. You just have to go somewhere else and find them, you know. They were not cooperative. So... I lowered my expectations, but when I got up in the morning, they were still sounding off, and uh, so I, your family or the elk? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I should clarify the elk. The family was soundly sleeping. This was way before uh, light, and so I clambered up the hillside uh, on the other side of the of the creek from where they were. Is like right behind camp and across the creek and up in a little basin where the elk were. So I was going to try and get a bead on them first and see how I might get in on this group. And uh, I never could see anything. But they kept on bugling. And it was, it was late in the morning before I really decided I better give up on a sighting of them and just go in there. And I was just a little reluctant. You know, you don't want to blow something that's been going on for a couple of days. Um, so as soon as I crossed the creek, I bumped a cow. And she clattered up the hill right straight towards all the action. And I kind of thought, oh, what do I do now? And I sat there for five minutes and thought, well, I just got to gotta get on it. Got to get up there. And I moved on ahead another 50 yards or 100 yards. I bumped a couple more. And they ran the same direction. And, uh, man. That's always a defeating dis- feeling. Oh, it's so discouraging. Because <laughs> you think that that's it. You'll never hear another yeah. peep. Maybe on the saddle as they're going off into the next drainage, you know, you might hear that bull say, you know, see you later, sucker. Yeah. <laughs> but they kept on bugling. And I bumped a cow one more time. And then I thought, okay, uh wind is uh is changing i'm gonna i'm gonna go out around these things and uh i started up the hill and uh i was walking through an opening and uh i saw a movement and i caught this bull coming straight down the hill at me and and he was nice and so i uh i froze and he got he got up there within about 75 yards of me and he stopped right behind a group of pine trees and uh had my boat to the side no arrows and i was thinking i can't see his head maybe i ought to stick an arrow on and i thought no because i'd been watching him and he'd he'd uh he'd hold up for a minute and look around you know and then he'd lunge ahead and i didn't want to be halfway through that and have him move. And then I noticed his eyeball through a couple of limbs there. And uh, I realized that I'd made the right decision not to do that because he was, he was looking at me. He, he moved another like 20 yards and he looked right at me. And I didn't move, still hands to my side. And I, very obvious, I was a man. You didn't have an arrow loaded or no, nothing? No, no, no. <laughs> no, it happened pretty quick. 
And uh, I normally don't even go through openings, but I was, I was kind of at a loss here what to do and kind of off my, my game. But um, I didn't move while he had an eye on me, which I, I don't, you know, I was really lucky to even see that, but I made the right call. Anyway, he turned around, and as he walked back through that stuff, kind of quartering away, I got an arrow on. And I swung around, you know, to to be more squared off to make a shot. And he he went behind this fallen pine tree, and it was it pretty much obscured him completely. And I drew back about halfway, and I was just hoping that he'd keep coming around. And he he came around, and he gave me a wide open shot at twenty three yards, and I finished my draw and got double lung shot on him. And uh, I heard him crash and wipe out a whole bunch of brush. It was on kind of steep ground, and I knew I had him. I, I waited a half hour anyway, and I went down there, and he knocked about half the limbs off a snag that was laying down the hill. Yeah. It, was a, it was a pretty awesome experience, you know, especially well, with the family there. So what are, what are some learning points to take away from that? Um, don't move. You just can't move. They're so, they're, they're just incredible at picking up movement. And, uh, that was fluky. I should have never seen him again. There must just been a whole bunch of bulls in there. And, uh, that the, the herd bull, which was him, would have just been, uh, working really hard to keep them out. There must have been a couple of hot cows in there. Yeah. yeah it was very, very lucky. But, uh, yeah, get your wind right. You know, I've hunted with a lot of people that just are so quick to uh, kind of almost attack. And they're they're pretty successful. Well, I've never really done things that way. I'm more reserved and uh, want to be more sure. And I'm sure I've blown uh, many, many opportunities. But... Um, I don't know. That's my style. There's a time and a place to be aggressive, but it's certainly not all the time. Mm-hmm. And that's that's the most popular style right now, especially um, amongst you know some of the YouTube hunters and stuff like that. They like a really aggressive style, and it makes for for better video if you can be aggressive and have a bull that'll match you with that. Mm-hmm. Um, that's an easy bull to kill, and it's going to make for a great film. But man, it is not, if you want to be successful, that cannot be the only trick in your bag. Right. Yeah. So, well, that's, that's pretty, pretty cool. Pretty amazing. It, it, <laughs> it's neat to hunt elk out of a camp. And when you're hunting out of a camp, you've got to be reserved because if you blow them out, you've got to pack everything up and go to a brand new place, probably be a whole day's ride. Mm-hmm. You know, you, yeah. you got to really slow it down yeah i'd say uh 30 to 1 i have blown elk out by being careless yeah by not necessarily making noises because you know it's pretty well understood that elk make noise too and they'll go back to grazing if you crack a great big stick you know within 100 yards of them and they'll notice it and they'll give you know that that look around but if they don't hear another one, they'll go back to eating. You know? yeah. Of course, it's, the wind is always sure uh, going to turn you in. But uh, The only things that are sneaky around elk are trying to do them harm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And sneaky sounds sound differently than just walking around sounds. Right. Yeah. You know, if you get the opportunity to, to see one, uh, you know, you're close enough to see one and you've made noise and then you, you stop making noise. They will, they will stay on the alert for minutes. You know, they want to see what's, what's making that noise and they want to see an elk probably mm-hmm. so that they can go back to business. They don't want to see a man or a wolf or something like that. Yeah. And ideally they'd like to smell another elk. Because that's, you know, their best source of information. Yeah. Oftentimes that's a satellite bull. Yeah. And he's, he's, uh, you know, he's out there prowling, you know, wants to find that, 
stray cow or you know big herd that bulls busy on the other end mm-hmm. other side tell me about mountain goat hunting <laughs> yeah i got me a once in a lifetime tag and i was bound and determined to get it with my traditional gear i had two good friends that were anxious to help me they they really sacrificed quite a bit to try and get me a goat and uh of course it's super rugged country to start with or they wouldn't be there what does that mean to you what what does super rugged country look like i mean we got people listening to this show in brazil so try and break it down for them. okay they are um they they seem to be super unconcerned uh with with people and i i w- would imagine maybe predators in general when they're on steep ground and it it is because they know that in 30 seconds they can be in this chute that is uh getting close to being vertical and nothing can get in there but a bird i mean it's incredible and they all run right toward that spot where it's just you know you you can't negotiate those those that terrain and a cougar would just, you know, fall to its death, you know, as catty as they are. And so they're they're on very, very steep, steep, rugged stuff. And they, they don't seem to, even, I've seen them eat grass, but uh, they're always after lichen or some small plant that looks almost like it's growing on the rocks. Sometimes they're in a place where you don't see any greenery in there. They're grazing. But it's um, treacherous, treacherous ground that they're on. And that's why they've evolved, I imagine. And their their weight is all on their front legs so that they can, uh, like, maybe turn around on a four-inch wide ledge or something like that. And they're so at ease with it. You see the little, the little uh, what do you call them, kids? Mm-hmm. They'll be on something that's uh, like 90% slope, and they'll be headbutting each other and trying to knock each other down, and it's it just makes your you just your stomach just kind of comes <laughs> <laughs> through your throat, thinking of what they're you know able to what what they may do, they might fall, you know. And it's one thing with a with a gun, you know, if you've got a goat on enough of a ledge, you know, you can shoot him right there. And if you get him good and killed, he's going to stay right there. As long as he doesn't do much kicking around and fall off. But with a bow, you need him on pretty secure ground to keep him from falling a couple mm-hmm. thousand feet. Yeah. Yeah, so our uh, our game plan was to get me between their chute and wherever we see him. And then try and work on him that way. Without getting seen. Yeah, yeah. And oftentimes I'd be like coming down right straight over the top of them. They're laying down underneath a rim and uh, trying not to roll a little rock or something. And uh, sometimes it was helpful to have like a wind or something that was creating other noise, but they always got to the shoot every time. I got a couple shots off, but they were moving and, you know, it was just not good so the very last day well we were in a really good spot um we were working on like four different billies and they would put up with us for about four attempts to get them and then they would be gone clear out and the last day we we had reserved one it might have been the biggest one too to uh, make the run on and uh, I got really close to it I was trying to come down in on the top of him and some hunters walked through the saddle they were elk hunting and bow hunters and uh, blew the goat out just before I was (laughs) I was just about to start drawing and uh, they they blew it out and so we went to the rifle the last day and uh 
we went back out there to that incident I just talked about where the bow hunters uh, blew it out and he was gone. That, that goat was gone and we didn't have any other options. All the goats we'd been watching were hidden and we just kind of went bushwhacking and saw one in a kind of an unusual place on kind of more level ground and I got a shot, got him. Nice. Yeah. How do you taste? Good. I really liked it. Yeah. The burger from my mountain goat, I don't care for much. Mm. And it's the toughest burger I've ever, ever, ever they are to tough. Eat, eat in my life. But the steaks and the roasts have been really good. Mm-hmm. I've got no issue with it. A lot better than a domestic billy goat, you know? Yeah, some of those, well, the billy, holy smokes, they can yeah. stink for, you can smell them a half a mile away. Yeah. Terrible. Yeah, smell that'll stay with you too. Mm-hmm. But no, they're they're pretty good. What's your hunting season going to look like this year? Oh, um, I'm feeling really good because I got my my shoulder operation mm-hmm. successfully completed, and I am through the rehabilitation process. And I just started shooting my hunting bow a couple of days ago. I've been for the last uh, oh. Two months, I've been shooting a real a light bow, like 35 pound, and I had a match set of arrows for it, and was honing in on my um, form and stuff, and then I got my big bow out, and uh, I can make a, almost a full draw, but I'm kind of a not a full draw guy. I think my bow is a little bit too, too strong, but shooting pretty good, so I'm feeling really good about that part. That's the, great. The last season I had was uh, pretty, pretty dicey because my shoulder hurt so much when I was pulling back. I concentrated more on the pain and what I was doing to my shoulder than where my my form was at. You know. Do you want to talk about how last season ended? Uh, not very much. <laughs> <laughs> but if you insist, I. Uh, the last day of the season, I was in a, a tree stand, and uh, I hadn't seen anything. And he'd been riding this tree for a while. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I had a couple cows. and a, Like days. A couple spikes. Oh, yes. Like a week. And so I was kind of getting tired of the whole scene, you know, looking at the same little log down there and same little trees. Anyway, uh, I always shoot a couple arrows before I get down out of the tree because that that steep shot is a little bit deceiving. I always shoot a little high and a little left. And so I'm always working on that. So I had me a rotten chunk that was sitting there where I figured I'd be most apt to to get a shot, kind of like with the trails and stuff that we're going through there. And... uh, it was probably legally not hunting hours, and it was the last day. And so I shot two arrows, my two practice arrows, and uh, maybe one of them wasn't all that good of a shot. So I thought, what the hell? We're done. We're done hunting, right? So I shot each and every one of my arrows at that chunk. Made some pretty good shots, too. And I started to uh, lower my bow, and I heard crack, shuffle, clunk. (laughs) (laughs) And I froze, and I watched this monster bull walk up to my little pile of arrows and sniff them all up and down, look around a little bit, take a few licks on the ground, and walked off very slowly, mm. and it was uh, it was a real it was a real nice bull, nicest bull I'd seen all year. That's how it ended. That's a bummer. Yeah, that's a real that's a real bummer. I love that story because it's so heartbreaking, but it's something that could happen to anybody. Mm. You know, yeah. it's getting dark. It's the last day. It hasn't been going well. It's easy to quit. Yeah, but yeah, that's definitely insult to injury. I, I did have a last day scenario that was very interesting. There was a bunch of llama hunters um, 
he was in that same tree. There was a bunch of llama hunters that kind of started moving in on me because one of them, there was like nine of them, nine guys. Gross. And they had, all of them had a llama or Ugh. two. And uh, they were they were camped quite a long ways away, but one of them had shot a cow and it ran up into the kind of my neck of the woods there. And they uh, they came up one day and they were uh, hollering and trying to, you know, get organized. Apparently one of them had laid his bow down on one of their rests when they were packing the meat and realized they'd left it somewhere and they were all pouring around on the hillside hollering about where where they thought it was or where they'd walked or hadn't. And uh, I was sitting there listening to all this stuff, you know, kind of dejected because who's going to, what, what elk's going to walk under my tree when that's going on? but I didn't want to show myself. Yeah. So I just had to sit there and suck it up. Well, they came the next day, and I think that was the last day. And these guys bugle about every two minutes. And so the the woods was just uh, full of man bugles, starting from about 3 o'clock till about an hour before dark. And... Uh, I heard them, they must be afraid of the dark or something because they, they all were way towards camp before it got dark, you know, before it even got dusk. And uh, I just was kind of disgusted by the whole thing. And uh, when I finally heard the last one going over the hill, I, I bugled. And uh, there was three bulls within three or four hundred yards of my tree that answered me and uh, so I got them all worked up let's one of them in a in a swamp that was uh, only like a hundred yards away from me was just going nuts hmm. and it was getting darker and darker and uh, I, I I thought I gotta change this up somehow you know it's, I got it about another 10 15 minutes of shooting light and I made a cow call and one of them just kind of ran out of nowhere and uh, ran right up underneath my tree and I was literally shooting straight down on him and uh, I missed I shot in front of him and he went ran out around my little clearing where I was uh, had my tree stand where I figured I'd be doing my shooting he had actually come in from behind and uh I waited about five minutes and Cal called again. A sucker came right back in the same spot. And I adjusted for my shot this time and I hit him. Hmm. And uh, he died right there about 50 yards away. <laughs> the last day of the season. That's awesome. <laughs> you got to tough it out. Yeah. You're the, you, you've, you've, you know, made it that far. Yeah. Just finish I, it out. Yeah. It seems like tenacity is the name of the game for... A traditional bow hunter. Well, know? when it comes to tenacity, you have a reputation that's well earned of being, you know, the hardest worker that anybody's ever met. Certainly, the hardest worker that I've ever met, and I think you you're kind of a legend for it. So, what what are some of your ethos around around labor and and on work, and then how does that kind of inform how you operate as a hunter? Well, um, I hunt by myself a lot because no one really wants to go to the trouble that I go to. And uh, I think about that sometimes, like, why am I, I'll get in a spot, you know, like in the middle of the night on a trail somewhere, maybe have some trouble. I lost some mules one time that bucked off over a cliff because I was in the middle of the night on a strange trail and got on a game trail on a switchback and got into some rims before I even knew where I was. And I think about, you know, what do I do these things for? It seems like everything I do is difficult. And so it's, uh, it's something in my psychological makeup. Maybe the way I was raised it might have something to do with my my father and wanting to please him to be noticed but i'm not sure 
But I knew I do know that uh, everything I do has a degree of difficulty that would probably exceed most people's interest at least. So that's why I do bow hunting. I think you know I I like that methodical routine kind of way of doing things, and uh, I'm kind of a sentimental guy, kind of a miser too. Like if I lose a piece of gear while I'm hunting, I'll find that piece of gear. I'll go back numerous times to try and line up the trees and the memory of of where I was when I think I lost that thing and usually can find my thing, you know, like somebody give me a arm guard or something mm-hmm. and I'll sit down and have a snack or something and get up and leave it. And it'll be half hour before I realize I don't have that thing and I'll, I'll go back. If it takes me the rest of the day, I'll, I'll find that damn thing, you know. That's just the way I am. A lot of people just go, oh, I'll just buy another one, you know. And so I'm not saying that's good or or what, but uh, it's just the way I am. And I think tenacity is uh, probably the best word to describe my being, yeah, my, my ethics. Yeah, I'd agree. I think we should all... Uh strive to be more tenacious yeah i suppose it depends on what what you're striving at but uh does it yeah yeah probably (laughs) i can think of things that you might be tenacious about that would be illegal (laughs) i know yeah we gotta gotta keep it legal that's for sure and uh yeah you had a career as a custom home builder Mm -hmm. you're a painter yeah um, not a house painter. Not a house painter. Painting painter. Yeah, painting painter. Yeah. A drawing drawer. Yeah, all uh, it, yeah. Uh, all all art forms that I have ever tried. I felt like I'd love to do that for the rest of my life. Yeah. Where can people check out more about you and and the art that you do? And well, I've got a kind of a not very well uh, updated website i think it says kirkscovelinart.com or something like that you could see a a gallery of prints and paintings but um, it's kind of a just a sample mm-hmm. and it has my phone number i think <laughs> <laughs> i'm not very tenacious at marketing i'll have you know yeah. i guess you know that yeah it gives me great joy yeah. to to be a bow hunter and uh and and walk around through the woods, and uh, not that I forget that I'm hunting, but I'm I'm looking for my next shot. I love to shoot my bow so much that uh, I'm looking for a log and a technical shot, and uh, I live I live for that. And occasionally, I'll make up for noise that I made, like the bow slapping on something or the arrow bouncing off something and it makes a noise and I'll compensate for that by being extra quiet and and uh, observant. I've actually killed an elk uh, that walked between me and the stump I was shooting at. Hmm. That's a bad choice for that elk. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah when I'm all tuned up. <laughs> yeah. I've got a steel target up on on the hill here next to my house that i shoot all the time Uh all the time and i pretty good at knowing the wind and everything and i was dumping um duck carcasses off there from all the ducks that i was shooting and i woke up one morning there was a coyote that thought he could run out there and Mm -hmm. grab a duck carcass at the base of my steel target like uh-uh. No, sir. I'm pretty good at that one. <laughs> <laughs> I got that yardage down. Yep. Well, I, I kind of feel sorry for gun hunters when I'm um, walking through the woods shooting at anything yeah. and everything because I make, who knows, maybe 50 shots a day while I'm hunting. It's a fun thing about a trad bow, for sure. Yeah. A compound guy can't do that at all. I mean, those arrows are 10 bucks a piece or whatever. And they'll explode. And, yeah. And, yeah, you uh, probably can't even find them no matter what you hit. Yeah. I can just shoot them. I've gone the whole season and never even broke an arrow or lost an arrow. Mm-hmm. And it's, I'm so proud of that. And, and I enjoy it so much. I just, 
feel sorry for the gun hunters. They can't do that. <laughs> Can you imagine somebody shooting 50 shots? That'd be funny. <laughs> like if you're just out there shooting rocks all day long. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Damn, I haven't seen the thing all day. How about you? No, I haven't either. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I will shoot a coyote or a grouse or something like that when I'm out gun hunting. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it's always worked out in my favor as far as I know. You know, there's been a couple times that I've been elk hunting, shot a coyote that, you know, I thought, well, maybe I shouldn't shoot. But, like, it's a coyote. It's a rule. I'm just going to go ahead and shoot him. And uh, then a little posse of elk will run out on the hillside. And like, oh, I wouldn't have known about them if I hadn't shot that coyote a second mm -hmm. ago. I'm waiting for them to uh, make wolves legal to shoot. Mm -hmm. In Oregon. Yeah. They're I've, really uh, loosening those regulations in Idaho right now. Yeah. Making it all year, no, no more limits. It it's fun. I, me and uh, my my son Lars, we were uh, doing some setup calling and stuff, and uh, we called in a pack of wolves, and they actually surrounded us, hmm. and uh, they thought they were going to get jump on an elk, and the wind changed or something, and they ran off, but uh, they were within range. Hmm. That would be really awesome to call in a wolf and shoot it with an arrow. Yeah, or anything. Yeah. It would be awesome with an arrow, but yeah. You know, these wolves are causing quite a few problems. I think if it's legal and you get an opportunity, I think we probably need to be shooting them. Yeah, I don't think they report the numbers that there are actually out there. Well, how uh, could you know? I mean, how, they're one of the hardest critters out there to hunt. How could you even know how many of them there are? Survey them and all this tight timber and big canyons and stuff. It's an impossible task. I have uh, camped in places where I can hear three different bunches. Yeah. Distinctly. Yeah. yeah. Pretty wild. Well, sir, I appreciate your time. I appreciate your stories. And uh, and I appreciate your mentorship in hunting. I learn a lot from you. Every time we talk about it, every time we hunt together, I learn a lot. And uh, you. Yeah. Yeah. You've, you've taught me a lot. Well, thank you. Thank you. I live in an old cabin with bad to non-existent insulation and wood heat. That cabin can see snow every month of the year and needs a good amount of firewood stacked in the woodshed to carry through the colder months. This spring, as my wood pile turned to smoke and ash, I noticed something metal pushing out of the decades of sawdust and bark. I kicked at it and unearthed a Stanley thermos. The cup was missing and it showed more worn stainless steel than green. There were dents in the metal and the handle looked like a puppy had chewed on it, but it still hadn't leaked the old coffee I could feel slosh inside. It took me back to memories of cutting firewood with my dad, waking up early for an elk hunt, or going out to the canyons to gather cattle. A Stanley thermos has the durability to survive whatever hard work you throw at it. You may find it carries memories as well as coffee. Learn more about their new and Classic line of products at stanley1913.com or at your local sporting goods store. And catch you next week. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and share the show with a friend. You can also rate the podcast and leave a review. Your support allows me to keep doing what I love, which is meeting incredible folks and sharing their stories with you. For more content and photos, follow the show on Instagram at Six Ranch Podcast or me at Six Ranch Outfitters. This episode was produced by Emily Brannigan with original music written and performed by Justin Hay. Art for the Six Ranch Podcast was created by John Chatelain and digitized by Celia Christofferson. Tune in every Monday for a brand new episode of the Six Ranch Podcast. I'll catch you next week.